Send me that. Send me that. Because I've been, I saw that cover the of the guy. Hello, everyone. How's everyone this evening? Good, how are you? I'm are doing you? well, thank you. Good, good. Um, any questions about anything? Good to see you all. Okay. I, oh, I'm sorry. No, go on. Um, could you explain the like next project we have coming up? I know you sent an email about it, um, but like, can you explain like what we have to do? Yes. Wow, you're ambitious. Good. Um, the next project, uh, I was going to have you look at historical websites, but I thought instead what would be more interesting is to find out what kind of primary sources are available in different towns in Massachusetts, particularly in like uh, town clerk records. I sent out a list of some places where you can find sources and where there are some things that are available. So if you are not from one of these places, I didn't mean to presume everyone is uh, in some town that has a town clerk, but if you uh, are not in one of these places, let me know. That is, there were, there were at the time 150 some odd towns in Massachusetts. They kept meticulous records and they did all kinds of things. There was the decision to declare independence in the spring of 1776 the Massachusetts Provincial Congress asked the towns how they should vote on independence. And the towns had a debate on it, which then is recorded in the town record books. Towns also were responsible for sending soldiers. That is, they would get a certain requirement to send soldiers. And another thing that some towns did was actually house prisoners of war, which I'll be talking about later on. So really what I want you to do is find out what the sources are, where they are. I'm not expecting you to do necessarily an in-depth study of them, but it's really a survey. What is available? Um, and if you can uh, get copies of them, I mean, I realize that town clerks have a lot of other things to do. They are uh, government agents and government agents sometimes can be very helpful and sometimes are less so. I'm speaking with some, knowing some of you might either now be or may become government employees. Um, but this strikes me as something that would be a useful way of finding out what is available or what is out there. And I'm not sure if this is helping at all to answer the question of what it is you're supposed to do. Um, I don't simply want you to recreate what's already there if you, uh, you know, but if you do have the good fortune to be in a place that's already digitized their town records, made them available, then all you need to do, I guess, is figure out how to use them. If it's a place where these things are sitting in the basement or in uh, someone's office, then um, 
you know, we, I'm not saying you have to, but that would be a good thing to know. So that's it. I know it sounds kind of vague and um, daunting. You're knocking on the door of a town hall that's closed because of the COVID virus and telling them you want to look at things from the revolutionary period. But it strikes me it's better use of your time than simply looking at historical websites. And again, you can do much of it by, you know, contacting them by email and documenting this. I mean, this is all part of the investigative process. And I sent you a list earlier of things that we know are available, uh, databases that have been collected and your job or your task is really to see what we can expand. If you're from some other place, let me know. Um, and you want to do something different, but it just struck me as a way where we could start figuring out what is possible, potentially available as part of this record. This is all part of the project I've been involved in with Revolution 250, thinking about the 250th anniversary of the revolution. And the big question we have is, okay, so all these historical groups which have gotten together to do this do, and you know, we'll have a commemoration next year, 2022, we're hoping to do a commemoration of the burning of the Gatsby, the, revenue cutter. And uh, this fall, actually, the city of Quincy is doing a recreation of the Boston Massacre trials. And, uh, you know, there'll be other things like this. 2023, big thing commemorating the 250th anniversary of the Tea Party. But then when all of that is done, what will we have left? Some things that came out of earlier observations were, um, well, a better understanding of uh, what is there that is a lot of historical research generally is sparked by these kinds of centennial or I think it's a semi sesquicentennial events and this is our opportunity to create something that will leave a lasting impression. Um, I will give more specifics uh, later on this week or next week because I know it's a big project and I'm still recovering from reading all of your first paper well not recovering I enjoyed reading all of your first papers and you're all looking ahead which is great. Um, so that's it. Should be an interesting assignment, finding out what is there and finding out how this can, these things can be made publicly accessible. Does that answer the question at all? Or is it just further confuse things and you want to go back to reading historical, uh, you know, websites? That makes sense. I have a question. Would like, if your town has like a historical society, would it be better to go to them than the clerk, you think? That would be the place to start. Town and does. those, the ten, usually people in the historical society are already invested in the history. And, you know, my um, experience in having dealt with government agents is you usually do need allies and other people who have done this. So yeah, that definitely would be a good place to start finding out what resources there are and who might have already done this work or be involved in it. You know, we're not, you don't, you don't need to reinvent something that may already be there. That's a good question, Megan. Other questions, thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, so you said if we're not in the US, we should just reach out to you. Yeah, yeah. So are okay. you not in the US, Tariq? Tariq? Uh, Saudi Arabia. Okay, yeah, so I don't know that they're gonna have a whole lot of material available, but the good news is some stuff has been digitized and those links that I sent out, which I'll send out again, do have stuff that you know you could probably look through and find something of interest. Yeah, uh, anything that's been digitized, it'll be easier to access and okay. I will definitely get a lot of information out of. Very good, okay. Or we can talk about an alternative project if you'd be more interested in that, okay? Good, um, anyone else? Um, and again, if you do, you just can let me know by email and we'll get started. I did want to start to talk a little bit about the first papers, which for the most part I enjoyed. Um, and I appreciate the work that people did in finding a primary source and then doing something with it. And, uh, and people did do interesting things, but there are a couple of things I wanted to talk about just in terms of um, how you go about writing something. Um, and I should warn you that when I generally talk about writing, I tend to, I can become really acerbic and bitter and it's just because it's my nature and I apologize for that. So um, it, it, I, I guess it's the way I was brought up where people mercilessly um, attacked each other for their writing and it made us better writers. So we thought, um, so um, let me see. Uh, a couple of just general things. Um, 
by the way, you're going to find, well, well, no, I'm not going to say you're going to find this. It's simply true. There, different people write differently, okay? Um, everyone has his or her own style, and that's a good thing. On the other hand, there are some common things people do that are bad that you should avoid doing. And I'm just going to outline some of them. Uh, you'll find some people get really irritated by some things and not others. And I'll tell you what irritates me. And if you stop doing these things, if you don't do these things, then uh, I'll be happy or happier. And so will you. Okay, so let me see. Um, one thing I would like people to not do, and I'm not attacking anyone for doing this, is don't use contractions so much. Uh, and, and actually, one thing that's impressed me in this set of, um, in your papers is, you're using really more imaginative contractions than I've experienced in the past. In formal writing, though, you should avoid using contractions, okay? Um, just a general rule. Also, punctuation marks go inside the quotes, not outside the quotes. And so that's just something to remember. Uh, also, the style in the United States is to use double quotes all the time. If something, if there is a quote inside the double quotes, then you use the single quotes. That's the, form, that's the formula here in the United States. In the United Kingdom and the British Commonwealth, it's the opposite. So uh, this could be a real gauge of whether you are a loyalist or a patriot, how you used your quotation marks. And I take careful note of this. Um, let us see. Uh, citations for quotes, you need them. A footnote, if you're only using one source, then you can do a parenthesis with the page number. But other than that, just um, use citations for footnote for your quotes. Every quote needs a citation. Um, avoid anachronisms um, and, and also avoid um, letting on you know how everything turned out. I um, was really, well, not really surprised. A number of folks, and people do this all the time, and I'm not just criticizing this group of 23 really smart people who wrote these papers, um, but generally you see this, someone you know, writing about John Adams in 1770 and say something, the future second president. And in 1770, the office of president did not exist. He didn't know he was ever gonna become president. So avoid this kind of anachronistic thing. I've even had someone refer to Abigail Adams in 1764 marrying the former president, John Adams. Of course, he hadn't even become president yet. Uh, by the way, it is the standard. You're president once, you keep the title. Typically, you do keep the highest title you've had, governor, senator, et cetera. Uh, people will call you that as kind of an honorific. They don't really have to. They could just, by the way, there's a big story we'll get to later about what we should call the president. Um, it actually does involve John Adams too, but uh, former president after he's been president, but you don't need, if, if you're writing about him when he's not president, there's really no reason to say he had been the president. For many of these people, being president wasn't the most important thing they did. In fact, you won't find that anywhere on Thomas Jefferson's gravestone that he had served as president of the United States. He has other things that he did where he thought were more important. So just avoid those kind of anachronisms. Avoid this kind of idea of you, you know what's going to happen next. So, um, so another thing, this is just one of these real quirks I have. And let me see if I can share this with you. Um, okay. Can you see this? screen and on, on the screen you'll see three sentences and why don't we just start one by one um jake can you read the first sentence for us in reading through the boston gazette from the period of february 7th to february 27th a great man insights uh can be gleaned from its pages okay there is a typo there it should be a great many insights can be gleaned yeah, from its pages. it's not as well funky Excuse right. me. Yeah, yeah. So um, let me see if I can correct that. Um, 
Okay. Um, so what's wrong with this sentence? Um, you, by the way, Jake, you're not the one who has to answer you. I oh, just, okay. but you can, if you have an answer, that's great. <clears throat> um, I don't know. Would you use a semicolon instead of a comma to separate? Is that like two, is that like two like sentences in itself? Mm, no, that's, that, 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 that's a good guess. Uh, but that does get to another thing. If you have a sentence so long, you think there should be a semicolon in it, you're probably better off putting a period there and making it two different sentences. Okay. That, 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 that I guess, is a harangue for a different, another day about sentences that get too long. And so you lose sight of what the point of the sentence is. Um, but let's see, if someone else can read the next sentence, maybe we'll get a, get a handle of what the problem is with all, all three of them have a similar problem. They may have more problems that uh, I was just focusing on one. I'm not sure if this is like the problem that you're looking for, but like this is what bothers me about the sentence is that it says like, there's a great many insights, but it like doesn't say what those are. And it kind of is just like a sentence just to like take up space, I would say, I don't know. That's another good point. And that's something you, you've picked up something else that I don't like is sentences that are just there to take up space. A sentence should add something. And uh, you should ask that what history, the big question historians ask all the time is, so what? And that should be on your mind. I know, okay, you have had to write this paper based on something you really weren't that interested in, but you at least have to say, well, so what? Why, well, you know, it's not simply a, an empty exercise. So yeah, so it doesn't really add anything, it just says, there are a lot of, you can glean a lot of insights from the pages of the Boston Gazette. Uh, and that's kind of a banal thing to say. And by the way, I, I can't remember who wrote the, any of these sentences. So I'm not holding anyone personally responsible for this, but um, yeah, okay, so that is a problem. Um, anything, but that's not the one I was thinking of. Um, therefore, I'm jotting you down as having an incorrect answer. Um, anyone else want to? Um, if I had to guess, I'd say, should the sentence fragments be switched before and after the comma? Okay, so how would you do that, Dylan? Well, the second one, for, it could, for example, could read, a common theme was made after gathering all the facts the letters presented after reading all 15 general orders. You know, actually, it could maybe sound better without a comma. I think it would sound a lot better. Yeah, yeah. That, that's and a very good could be done for the one above it. I think that's I think a very that's a very good point. And I think and it shows that what you should be doing is thinking, how does this sound and not just plunking down a lot of words that are going to a fill up space and be in a general way convey what you're trying to say. So yes, try to be concise and say what you mean. But the problem we have is, you know, we're writing a lot. We do have to fill up a certain amount of space. And plus, as we're writing, sometimes we are figuring out what it is we mean. Um, I the, have a question. Yes. yes. So the second one, um, that's mine. So I'm just curious. What? Thank so, you, Jake. Thank, thank you for, own, for your honesty, owning up to it. Yes. So um, since we're going over it, um, I'm you, you do you think there's something wrong with it? What he said makes more sense, but so this is not correct grammar? Like, no, it's it? not, actually. Oh. Ah, so, that, so yeah. See, there are rules of grammar, and this is one, uh, and I realize at some point between the time I was in school and the time you were in school, this is something that uh, I think the teachers union said we no longer want to teach because it's difficult and painful. And um, causes us to spend a lot of time reading. Um, and I hope someone is taking notes of the different public servants I attack in every class. Um, but yeah, it is incorrect grammar. It's actually something called a, this is a good thing to remember, a dangling participle. And here is the general rule. That is, um, you have a phrase like this or like this, Actually, this is somewhat something somewhat different. This is sentence has uh, different kind of issues, uh, and or this. And we often start a sentence with this kind of a phrase, just because it's a kind of a good way to do it. You have here a verb, reading through or reading all. The 
noun that comes after the comma has to be the thing attached to this verb. By the way, I'm really not good with grammar, so um, insights is the noun here. Uh, so uh, it's hard for me to remember the you know, subject, object, et cetera, et cetera. But I do know nouns and verbs. So in reading through, the noun following the comma has to be the thing that was doing the reading. And similarly here. Um, otherwise, it's the theme that was reading all the general orders. And that's not it. I mean, Jake was the one doing the reading or in this case, the person reading the Boston Gazette was the one doing the reading. You know, there is a sentence that illustrates this. Uh, Swinging by his tail from a tree, Professor Allison saw many monkeys as he walked through the zoo. You know, the person may be saying that Professor, Al I saw many, Professor Allison saw many monkeys swinging by their tails from the tree, but the sentence actually reads, Professor Allison swinging by his tail from a tree. That's you see, not something that would have happened. So it's a simple grammatical thing, and it's something easy to do because what you're doing is making a more complicated sentence out of a sentence that could be a lot simpler. And that is gonna lead you into this kind of problem. So um, I think we have beaten that particular dead horse enough for the moment. Let's just talk about something more important in terms of writing, and that is the first paragraph that you write. And I, I, I got this as I was reading through many of your papers. Um, the first paragraph often had a long discussion about the Revolutionary War or about the importance of primary sources or something else that really didn't help me know what the paper was going to be about, other than it might be something about the Revolutionary War or something about primary sources. And I see what's happening here is you're writing and you're really trying to figure out what it is you want to say. And so it is easy when you're doing that just to kind of run through thoughts. And then after a page or two, sometimes more, you get to the point. I was going to see if I had any, I didn't, don't unfortunately have an example here, but what I've suggested on a number of your papers, and you might have thought this was unduly harsh, is simply cut out the first two pages because there's really nothing there that you need to say. However, I know that in terms of just writing, you do need to kind of warm up. I, I used to find this when I was you know, in college and writing things, that I would write for a couple of pages and then get to the point, and then I would go back and rewrite and cut out everything before the point where it really started which is what I think would be a good strategy for anyone writing to do. You're going to do a number of drafts as you write. And believe me, when you rewrite things, it's easy. I, I'm not gonna harp on how much more difficult I had it when I was your age and doing any writing. Um, because you know we did everything then no we didn't do everything by carving it into stone we did it on typewriters and then if you made a mistake you had to go back and retype the whole thing unless you were uh, had a typewriter with a cell correcting ribbon and if you change something in one place you had to change everything else it makes you a little more careful but also you write more and you can then accumulate drafts now our tendency is and we all just you know do drafts in one screen and sometimes it's hard to say where you change things and so on. But you'll be writing and you'll, um, how many drafts do people usually do when they write something? I uh, usually do like two or three. Two, two or three. Anyone do more? I do one. Do one, okay, yeah. I like, Unless like a teacher says you have to do an additional draft, my mm -hmm. like, own thing, like I'll just like proof, re I'll re like reread it and correct it. I'm not gonna like just start a completely new paper. I feel like if anything, wouldn't that be kind of like, I don't wanna say wasting your time, but say you have a good paper, yeah. but you no one needs edits. You're gonna yeah, just yeah. go over something completely new or wouldn't you? No, just not, just not if you don't feel you need to, but uh, I always generally need to. And I'm always revising things. 
I, I used to be able to tell how many drafts because I'd have this one, then I would have another because I'd have to rewrite the whole thing, then I have to rewrite the whole thing and so on. Um, now, yeah, if you can do it with one, God love you. Um, well, I still have to like go back and edit and change things and do well, all sure, that. Well, sure, sure, sure. I'm not necessarily saying, okay, you finished this draft. Now, okay, now I'm just gonna start another one and, um, you know, you're use that, but move things around, right? Uh, and or um, change it if you need to. If you don't need to, I'm not saying, yeah, you need to revise everything. Um, I'll have take another look at your paper, Jake, and tell you if I think you should have. But um, I, I think I do actually. Okay. Okay. Approach. Okay. Um, so one thing you can do unless like Jake or me, you're a native born genius who doesn't need to do that. No, I do need to do a lot of rewriting and rewriting. Um, is once you, I, I never can write the first paragraph until I have figured out what the paper is about. And this sounds really counterintuitive. The, I, I, by the way, I'm also not really good at thinking of titles for things. Uh, my advisor, who's a very good writer, would say, once you figure the title, everything else is easy. Um, I've never been able to think of a good title, which is maybe one reason why I struggle so much with the rest of the process. So you have, um, okay, so Jake's read his paper. What was your paper about, Jake? I did Joseph Plum Martin, I think that was Joseph it. Plum Martin, okay, yeah, okay, now I remember, yes. Um, okay. Um, so that's a little bit of a different case. We maybe can talk about someone else's who, uh, some of you were on the right track and most were not. And which is one reason I'm really belaboring this point about the first paragraph being important. You really can't write it until you know what you've said in the rest of the paper. And that's one reason why, so in Jake's case, he could just then look it over, read it over and say, okay, this is what the paper is saying. And therefore I will, um, you can write this. Let me just, we can actually do this uh, in a simpler way, I think, by showing. Let me go back to my shared screen. Okay. A good opening paragraph in an essay like this, or pretty much in any essay you're going to write, is only going to have three sentences. That's enough to get started because what just as with each sentence, you want the reader to know something. With this paragraph, you want the reader to know what it is you are going to be writing about. And it can be anyone or anything. Um, does anyone want to just tell me what their paper was about? I did um, the Abigail Adams letters. Okay, so I wasn't I, too confident on it, but. Well, a number of people did the Abigail Adams letters. So we actually could have team Abigail. Um, and by the way, one thing I noticed is I really commended some of you for not referring to Abigail Adams as Abigail. It's kind of a tendency we have to call people by their first names and she probably wouldn't have liked it. Um, but, um, okay. So what did you have to say about the Abigail Adams letters? I talked a lot about her. So I had like three main topics about her but my main one was her and John's letters about okay. um, smallpox and their children and how her house is becoming like a hospital after okay taking care of that's them. good that's good so as your first paragraph I actually have Lilith's paper right here um, as most know the American Revolutionary War took a big role in shaping America's society from social to economic forces and more involvement in politics awards has been just, so this isn't really about Abigail Adams. Yeah, uh, I tend you're, you're, to, um, I used to, I did it, like I used to write my essays the same way you said, like how you do your body paragraphs first and then your intro mm -hmm. after, but for this one I didn't and I kind of regret not doing okay. that. Okay, so you know, you know, you don't need to tell us that, yeah, I used to do it that way, but don't. Okay, so you said, okay, Abigail Adams, what? Um, wrote a lot of letters or uh, Abigail Adams's letters let me see. You said that she focuses on three things, right? What were they? Or what were the things she focuses on? 
um, her and John's home life. And then I also did her letters with um, Mercy Otis Warren. And is there a difference? Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is okay. Uh, first two sentences just going to tell us something about her letters. And then the third sentence is just going to tell us the big question we have as we start reading the essay, which is, so what? I mean, what are we going to learn in reading uh, Lily Carey's take on the letters of Abigail Adams? So what is it we're going to learn from this? Do you want um, me to? Just tell us, and I will be writing. I'll be your amanuensis. Um, so <laughs> for do you want me to focus on like each one individually or like both of how they're both? No, this is this like is the together. this is the final sentence of the first paragraph. So it's just the sentence that is going to tell us what the rest of the paper is going to do. So from the letters between both Abigail to John and Abigail to Mercy Otis Warren, she discusses a lot about what is going on with home life, but also her heavy involvement in politics around the war while juggling mm -hmm. how to keep while okay. taking care, tending to home life or something like that. Okay, so something like this, which I have just written here, um, is enough really to get you started. It tells you the reader, all the reader really needs to know about Abigail, about what we're going to get in the letters, although we're going to find lots of other interesting things in this. And so good. Um, yeah, so that's really, you don't need to tell us about what, how important the revolution was or who Abigail Adams was or when she married John or, you know, whether he was a good guy or a jerk or anything like that. It's going to come across um, in the letters. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, so just short first paragraph, three sentences that kicks the whole thing off. And you know, those, I, I should have counted how many wrote about Abigail and John, and each of you could, ha each of you could have a similar, similar first paragraph or a different one, because each of you is writing a different paper. By the way, this is really the only formulaic thing I want you to do. Um, just a good first paragraph, and then in your subsequent paragraphs, have each one focus on a particular thing. Um, we sometimes have a tendency to start a different subject. And what I've done, what I've been reading, is note this, where you should break up paragraphs. Um, I don't like to read long paragraphs. And so I'm always on the lookout for paragraphs that go on too long. Um, so that's. Anyone else want to volunteer a topic and uh, a topic they wrote about? And gee, how could I write a first paragraph that would properly convey what it is I'm going to say? I can try, but I think I approached this completely wrong. Like my situation was I wrote this like a secondary. Yeah. Rather yeah. than a primary, which was my bad. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you could have done differently, I think, but, you know, we'll let bygones be bygones, Jake, and um, learn from our experience and move on. So this is essentially it. This is my um, writing tips for today. Just keep your first paragraph, uh, condense it, uh, three sentences, one to introduce it, one to just add something, and the final one to kick it off, and then um, the other things on punctuation. Oh, another thing that I really, really don't like, and I should have mentioned this earlier, is the passive voice. And somehow when we write history, it is easy to lapse into the passive voice because we're writing about all these events that already happened. And so let me just see if we can give examples of this. Um, let's see. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, 
no one wrote this sentence, by the way, it just came naturally out of my typewriter. The Battle of Brandywine was fought in September 1777. And it says, what is passive about it? It's the verb tense. The verb tense, was fought. This is a passive verb. So you have this battle, it was fought. And, you know, people died in this. And for some reason, people were shooting at each other. So it's not just this battle that happened, but it is something that happened for a certain reason because certain people caused it. So the big thing that the passive voice does is take away any, it takes away a number of things. One of them is any kind of agency. That is someone is responsible for something. Um, actually, the, the classic passive voice formulation is a political one. Mistakes were made. Yeah. It doesn't say who made them and what the consequences were, but yeah, uh, mistakes were made. As a, this battle was fought. And so it takes away agency and it also lulls you into thinking that things just kind of happen. So avoid the passive voice. Instead, say that um, the British Army attacked the Americans at Brandywine. This, this way, at least, you see something happening. And you can get more specific and talk about who was there um, and where Brandywine was. By the way, another thing that I do this all the time and it's a, a habit I have, so I maybe shouldn't tell you for fear you'll pick it up, is either beginning or ending the sentence with a date because dates are the things that really are em have emphasis and it's an easy way to begin, easy way to end, but often the date isn't that important. So, you know, just avoid doing that and um, you'll be a better writer than I am. Okay, I think I've probably spent more time than I should on this and, um, other questions, general writing thoughts. Now that I've told you some of the things I don't want you to do, and I, I think I, I'm trying to spend more time telling you things you do, uh, you should do and are doing that I like, um, but we can move on and talk about what's happening back in, where did we leave off last time? It seems like a long time since uh, we were here talking about the revolution. I remember we were talking about um, when they're when the um, Merrick, um, the colonists on the, the were going up to Maine with um, in the new a little bit of Canada, I think. Yeah, so there was a Canadian campaign that had happened, and then anything else since then? Oh, um, I can remember. I, th I think there was something about Burgoyne and how he had come over to Canada and it was sort of leading into Saratoga, but. <laughs> okay, yeah, so the Burgoyne is, uh, comes back to Canada, thinks that would be a good idea to go that way. Okay, anything else that anyone remembers from last we time? We talked about the travels of the Marquis de Lafayette. Oh, the Marquis de Lafayette. Okay, good. Anyone else have any? Yeah, I was gonna say, I think we talked about Hessian and French involvement last class, but Hessian might have been the class before. I also feel like it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, it has been, yeah, but I'm glad for bringing things way from way back, like uh, weeks ago. Okay, um, other things? Uh, Franklin and France, that yeah, was big. That was big, okay, I'm glad you remembered, Sean. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, let's see, Franklin does get to France and Lafayette gets to Philadelphia. Um, and did I tell you what happens when Lafayette arrives in Philadelphia? They said they didn't want him. Yeah, he gets told to wait. He was told to wait, that's yeah. right, okay. And he's told come back tomorrow and you can have five minutes. And so he does come back tomorrow and he has five minutes to tell Congress why he has come and why they should let him stay. And so he outlines what he has done, that is escaping from France under threat of arrest by the king, chartering his own yacht, buying his own yacht, outfitting it, and um, arriving here, then walking from Charleston, South Carolina to Philadelphia. And 
he says, having done all this, I think I can ask of you two favors. One, that I be permitted to serve as a volunteer, and two, that I be permitted to serve at my own expense. This was quite extraordinary. No French officer had ever said, hey, let me serve as a volunteer at my own expense. They came and said, hey, I want to run the show. And so they said, okay, Lafayette, yes, you can stay and serve as a volunteer. And they notify Washington, we have another French volunteer. And Washington is not happy with this. And it's quite a while, by the way, it's a few weeks before Washington and Lafayette meet. Lafayette first sees Washington at the City Hotel in Philadelphia. And Lafayette is immediately struck by the person of George Washington. And Washington seems to have had a kind of charisma, a way of impressing people. He was an impressive person. You know, Abigail Adams wrote to her husband, John, after she first saw Washington, you had told me what a character he was, but hadn't really told me half of it. She saw he combined the statesman with the uh, general and so on. You know, Abigail Adams was impressed with uh, Washington. I should say Abigail Adams was not always a very astute judge of character. When she first saw Benjamin Franklin, she thought he must be a very devout Christian uh, and had other things. She got to know Franklin better and thought much less of him the more she knew him, but that's a story for another day. So anyway, Lafayette does, is, does impress Washington, but still Washington's not really happy about having this French volunteer hanging out, but does tolerate him. Um, now, while this is happening, the big problem for Washington and for Congress is the fact that General Howe and his army are now approaching Philadelphia. Howe had left New York with 17,000 men in July, and it was unclear, or June, and it's unclear where they were going. And then they see, they're, they're sighted at the end of July off of the Delaware Capes, and they think, okay, they're going to head up the Delaware River but then they take to sea again. And then in August, Howe's army begins making its way up the Chesapeake Bay. And they're going up the Chesapeake Bay to um, the Elk Creek. It, you know, Chesapeake Bay has a lot of little uh, inlets and riverways and it's unclear. It's unclear where exactly they're heading, but if you are Washington, you are trying to imagine where it is, how and his 17,000 man army might going. Where would you go if you were General Howe and you had 17,000 men? I know no one expected when they woke up this morning before the end of the day to have to ask, what would General Howe do? I don't know if anyone has that as a bracelet or a thing. I don't think anyone ever has. What would General Howe do? And maybe you would do the opposite. Jay, uh, Dylan's showing us is what would, oh, that's your cat. I thought you were showing us your General Howe uh, inspirational quote. Just a quick question on this. Yes. Um, yes, so he'd taken New York and he's in New Jersey at this point. Is that sort yes. of the strategic yes. situation? Yes. Yeah. Oh. All right. Um, yeah, so there's still a British army, a smaller army occupying New York, and that's under General Clinton. And Howe has occupied New York. The, things haven't gone as well in New Jersey. They also have Newport, Rhode Island. And so he has left New York, and someone in England wrote that General Howe has taken the war with him and gone we know not where. And so this is the question Washington has and the British ministry has. Where would you go if you were General Howe and you're trying to put down this rebellion in North America? I mean, it, it seems like New England was kind of rough going. Um, so maybe driving south and trying to break uh, Virginia would be good. That, that could be. And go. going into Chesapeake Bay certainly would threaten Virginia. Um, you know, and that could have been an interesting choice on the part of General Howe to bring his army into Virginia, the next most rebellious place after New England, where, um, yeah, uh, but that's not where he's going. So if you're Washington, you kind of have to anticipate what is going to happen with Howe's army. And 
It's not the last time, by the way, that a British army will be in the Chesapeake causing mayhem, but their real goal is Philadelphia, which is what they had anticipated when they saw it off of, this is what they anticipated when Howe left New York, that Philadelphia is the capital of this confederation. So it would be a great, um, not necessarily a strategic coup, but a, uh, still an important thing to occupy the enemy's capital, such as it was. And so Washington, with his 11,000 men, is trying to protect Philadelphia, as Howe, with 17,000 men, is moving toward Philadelphia, having landed at Elk Creek, which is in Maryland, and now they're marching north and east toward Philadelphia. And Washington knows by this time, if he gets his army in front of Howe's army and they have a fight, it's probably not going to go well for his army. For one thing, his army is about a third smaller than Howe's. His army is less equipped, poorly trained, and so on. So Washington wants to avoid a direct confrontation with the British army, but he also can't simply say to the British army, okay, why don't you take Philadelphia? Um, because of course, Congress would be unhappy with that. And it would be a real loss to the American cause to lose Philadelphia. Um, you know, New York, Philadelphia, Newport, all in the hands of the British. How can the Americans pretend that they're actually conducting a real war against the British? So it's, um, as I said, so, so we know now how is heading toward Philadelphia. And he has under him Cornwallis and Niephausen. These are his two main commanders. Cornwallis, the British commander. Niephausen is a German commander. And what Washington has to do is simply try to slow these guys, slow them down, knowing it is inevitable that the British are going to take Philadelphia. And Congress has to pack up, which it does. And Washington, before this, we know the British are on their way to Philadelphia. Washington has his army parade through Philadelphia. And he actually has the men march from one end of the town to another. And then they loop around the town and then come back and march through again. So the people in Philadelphia think Washington has an army about twice or three times as large as he really does. He's trying to boost their confidence. Uh, and he knows Congress, Congress is going to lose confidence pretty quickly in a commander who cannot hold the capital against an invading force. And so Congress does flee to York, Pennsylvania, and Washington's had his army hold them off long enough. And then probably more importantly than saving Congress is the fact that Green, one of Washington's commanders, General Nathaniel Green, is able at Brandywine Creek to hold off the British long enough so that Washington and most of the rest of his army can also get away toward York, Pennsylvania. Seeing that the British are gonna take Philadelphia, all we really can do is slow them down. So by early September, mid-September of 1777, the British army occupies Philadelphia. And for General Howe, now this is a great opportunity to show what will happen here you have this place that the rebels have had as their capital. Now it's occupied by the British army. So this is really an opportunity for Howe and the British to show things will be a lot better for everyone if you simply go back to being part of the British Empire and give up the rebellion. That is, had the British governed Philadelphia well, things might have turned out differently. And Philadelphia was not a place filled with hot-blooded rebels about a third of the people in Pennsylvania were Quakers. And Quakers have moral scruples against war of any kind. So the Quakers were neutral in much of this. Um, also, Philadelphia has a lot of loyalists. So the people who, um, for the most part, fairly wealthy people. I don't wanna have you think that loyalists tended to be really wealthy, but they're people who had benefited from British trade and there are a number of really important political figures in Pennsylvania who have remained loyal to the crown. Um, lo important uh, merchants and others. Um, you know, we're Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, big state, kind of uh, fractious politics, and there are really strong factions in Pennsylvania that play out in the revolution. Um, 
and one of the most important political figures in Pennsylvania at this time was a guy named Joseph Galloway. And Galloway had been speaker of the Pennsylvania Assembly. He had been an ally of Benjamin Franklin's in the 1750s and 60s when Franklin and Galloway were trying to get the Pennsylvania colony taken away from the Penn family and given to the king. They wanted it to be a royal colony. And it was a fight then between the assembly and the Penns. And Franklin and Galloway had been on the side of the assembly. Most Quakers had been on the side of the Penns. Many of the wealthy merchants had been on the side of the Penns. And by the way, the Penns won that. Uh, and now you have this rebellion that breaks out, not against the Penns, but against the king. And this is further dividing things in Pennsylvania. So if Howe were really savvy, he would have made sure Philadelphia was well governed, and that would have brought more people into supporting the British, thinking, okay, they at least uh, don't have the kind of um, incompetence we saw in Congress. Now, Gal uh, Howe thinks it would be a good choice to put Joseph Galloway in charge of the city but it turns out to be a mistake. Galloway, um, he had been in politics for a long time, made a lot of enemies, and also he had a very high opinion of himself. And so it wasn't really good at bringing people together so much as in telling people, I told you so, and if only you would listen to me. Uh, one of the persistent themes in Joseph Galloway's career is he always had been right, and if only people had done things his way, things would have turned out differently. So. Uh, it doesn't go as well as it might have under Galloway. But uh, meanwhile, Washington and his army have been dispersed. Washington and his army are you know, well beyond Philadelphia. General Howe is uh, pacifying Philadelphia, establishing bases around the city. And one of the strongest is a German town just outside of Philadelphia. And on the 4th of October, just a couple of weeks after Howe had taken Philadelphia with very little fighting, uh, Washington has his forces attack the British base at Germantown. Better defended, better fortified, and the attack isn't a success, but it does what Washington needs it to do, which is to demonstrate to the British that the revolution's not over. He is still fighting. In fact, in Europe, one of the people watching this very closely was Frederick the Great, the King of Prussia. And Frederick was always rooting for the Americans for a variety of reasons. And he said that when he heard about the loss of Philadelphia, he knew the rebellion was over. He was kind of sad. Then two weeks later, he gets the news of Washington's attack at Germantown. And he said, then I knew that this army under this commander could not lose. So Washington, having surprised the British at Germantown, then takes his army into a camp at Valley Forge, north and west of Philadelphia, where they'll spend the winter of 1777 and 1778. So while this is happening here in Philadelphia, things look really bad. You've just lost the capital. Meanwhile, our friend Burgoyne has come to um, Canada with uh, 7,000 men, about 4,000 of them British, 3,000 are Brunswickers, that is from Germany. And they are led by um, Baron von Riedesel, R-E-I-D-E-S-E-L. And he comes with his wife and a couple of his children, and she keeps a diary of this. She writes a wonderful journal of her experiences in America with Burgoyne's army. And when Burgoyne and his group get to Canada, um, Governor Carleton resigns because he had proposed the same thing the previous year. The king refuses to accept Carleton's resignation. And let me see, I meant to find a map so I can show you what's happening here. I regret I'll have to um, draw a map for you, to give you a sense of what's happening here in British North America. Okay, so um, these for our purposes will be the Great Lakes. And this is the Hudson River, goes into New York. Okay, and Burgoyne's plan is to come down Lake Champlain, come down Lake Champlain into New York and have Clinton or Howe in New York come up and join him. 
Meanwhile, he has another force going this way to Lake Ontario, and they are going to come down here through the Iroquois country and come up the Mohawk River, joining up with the Iroquois. And this is going to cut off New England and also bring the native people into an alliance with the English that will really disrupt the American frontier. And this is, on paper, this looks like a great campaign. It looks like a really a great idea, a brilliant idea, and Burgoyne got the idea after the failed Canada campaign. And you recall, the Americans got their idea for their failed Canada campaign after the Seven Years' War, when this whole area had been a war zone between the Indians, the French, the, um, and the English. So this is the big plan of Burgoyne. Now, uh, he has um, Barry St. Laguerre, who is another uh, British officer, who is going to be coming up the Mohawk River, and he's gonna join up with the Iroquois. Now, the problem here is that the Iroquois are neutral in the war. There are six nations of the Iroquois, though, and St. Laguerre persuades warriors from the Mohawk, the Seneca, and the Cayuga to come along as observers. And their first real campaign is at Fort Stanwix. And Fort Stanwix is today um, Rome, New York. Uh, the Americans, by the way, call it Fort Schuyler. So Fort Stanwix is held by a small group of American militia and St. Laguerre and his warriors come to attack. Now, the Americans uh, have reinforced Fort Stanwix. Actually, the attack at Fort Stanwix, the um, guys besieged at Fort Stanwix are able to get messengers out that we need reinforcements. And reinforcements come in the person of Benedict Arnold, who brings along with him uh, warriors from the Oneida and Tuscarora. So you have some, now some Iroquois siding with the British, some Iroquois siding with the Americans, and at Fort Stanwix, they're all engaged. So you have Iroquois actually fighting other Iroquois. This really is going to lead to the collapse of the Iroquois Confederation, and it's really a bad thing for the Iroquois it's a good thing for the Americans at Fort Stanwix because they're able to hold off this British assault. So St. Laguerre can't continue up the Mohawk River to join up with Burgoyne, who's now coming down Lake Champlain and the Hudson River to attack at, to um, uh, separate New England from the uh, rest of the resistance. Also, um, the other problem is no one had told the Howes Howe is supposed to send forces up the Hudson River to join up with um, Burgoyne. Howe, as I've told you, is already in Pennsylvania and he's quite preoccupied there. And how uh, Burgoyne finally does get a message to General Clinton, who is the commander in New York, telling Clinton, can you send reinforcements up, try to take the forts along the Hudson River. At the same time, Clinton gets a message from Howe, who is his superior officer, telling him, send 2,000 more men to Philadelphia. Well, Clinton does have to wonder why Howe, who already had 17,000 men, has taken Philadelphia, needs more men, but Howe is his superior. And you do have to follow the orders of your superior, not the entreaties from Burgoyne. So Clinton does send some forces up the Hudson, uh, but also has to divert more to help out General Howe with whatever he is doing in um, Philadelphia. And this campaign of Burgoyne's, it, it has one big factor working against it. And that, of course, is the weather. And Burgoyne knows that by the end of October, it's going to be pretty much impossible for him not only to get his forces back to Canada, but to maintain a supply line. So he's really looking at the calendar. And in August, early September, as they're making their way down Lake Champlain, the Hudson River, he's anticipating at some point, I have to be reinforced by Clinton. And there is an American army sitting just uh, along the Hudson River, commanded by Horatio Gates, um, 
and actually a bigger army than um, our friend uh, Burgoyne has. So he needs someone to attack Gates from the rear, and that someone he had hoped would be Howe. Now he hopes it will be Clinton, but it seems less and less likely that that is going to happen. And behind him, he knows the supply lines are going to freeze over. The lakes will freeze. There will be uh, you know, drift, uh, huge drifts of snow in these mountains. He hadn't really known how mountainous the area was, how inhospitable, inhospitable it is in the winter. Um, on October the 7th, Burgoyne did attack um, Gates's army and he sends a notice to Clinton to come up the river. Clinton is able to retake the forts along the lower Hudson. Then, as I said, he gets this order. And he also gets word from um, Clinton that, you know, I have to send my troops to Philadelphia. Sorry. Now, Burgoyne is also calculating, if I stay here, I will have to have enough forage to provide my men and horses, 11,000 men and 20,000 horses and oxen. They need a lot of grain. And what he sees in the fertile grain fields to the south are rising pillars of smoke because the rebels are burning their crops to prevent them from falling into the hands of the British. So Burgoyne knows, okay, the escape route behind me is going to be frozen. I can't get back that way and won't have enough provisions to feed 11,000 men on their way back, or 7,000 men on their way back. And ahead of me, there's not gonna be anything to eat. Plus there's an army ahead of me. So he does in late August, send out a foraging party to uh, what then would have been called the New Hampshire Grants, 900 Germans. They know there are great horses being raised in the New Hampshire Grants, now Vermont. And Vermont, the New Hampshire Grants had been fighting a civil war against New York. And the, um, and by the way, New England wasn't really that worked up about this invasion at first. Um, New Englander, there aren't a lot of New Englanders with Washington's army. There are some with Gates's army. So it seems like we're doing all of we can, but now you have this British army coming down here. We kind of can see how this might end, but, um, we don't know how it is going to end. And one of the really telling things, this is one of these great stories from the war that uh, changes public perception is this. Um, among the loyalists, uh, well, there was a, a um, um, Burgoyne had loyal Americans fighting with him. And sometimes they were commanded by other loyal Americans and sometimes they're commanded by British officers. In this case, there's a Lieutenant Simon Fraser and Simon Fraser, as many British officers and soldiers did, met a young American woman and they were engaged to be married. Her name was Jane McRae. And she is kind of accompanying this army as it's making its way down the Hudson River. And as things begin to go badly, she is being uh, going from one house to another. And some of the Indian allies who have been along with Burgoyne are going, beginning to get a sense that things aren't going as well as they should. And for the Indians, staying in camp during the winter wasn't something they were going to do. What the Indians will do is go home and spend the winter hunting. You know, summertime is a time you do fighting. And the reason you go, you fight is so you can get trophies of war. Um, things you've taken from people you've killed or scalps or other things. So if you're an Indian who's accompanying Burgoyne's army, what you want to do is get stuff that you can bring home. And then that will show what a warrior you are. And one of the big, biggest trophies, of course, you can have is a scalp. And you then can go hunting in the winter and then next spring or next summer, come back and join this force again, if things seem to be going well. But Indians don't do siege duty, don't do that kind of thing. They're good warriors in some regards, but not good warriors in the sense that the British army really needs good warriors now. So they're beginning to think maybe we should go home and we really haven't gotten any stuff. And one reason we haven't gotten any stuff is 
Burgoyne has been very strict, telling the Indians, you cannot take scalps, you cannot raid things from the dead. He doesn't really like the Indians as allies. This is one of the big ironies in what's about to happen. Um, and what's about to happen is this. Um, Ms. Fra Ms. McRae and one of her friends, an older, a middle-aged woman, who is described in the record as a um, fat, sharp-tongued, loudmouth woman. Um, I'm not quite sure if any of that is true or even if it's relevant, but this person seems not to have liked her very much. She gets into an argument with one of the British officers and there's a couple of Indians around and in what turns out to be a scuffle, um, the Indians actually accidentally kill Jane McRae. And since what the Indians want to do now anyway is leave, what the Indians who killed Jane McRae then do is scalp her as well as the, her, her friend and take their scalps and head away. This of course is a very bad thing for Ms. McRae. It's also a, it's a very tra tragic thing for Lieutenant Fraser, her betrothed, and, uh, and also for Burgoyne because he wanted to make sure the Indians aren't doing this kind of thing. And here now they're scalping one of our own uh, allies here. Uh, is actually getting married to one of Burgoyne's officers. And Burgoyne does track down the Indian who now had Jane McRae's scalp. And actually, Lieutenant Fraser buys the scalp back uh, and keeps it. And every year on her birthday, we'll bring it out. It's kind of a touching thing. This is a very romantic story, I think, um, the, the scalp. And it's a story that then circulates at the time. And what New Englanders start hearing is Burgoyne has turned loose the Indians on the frontier. And this is something that rouses the New Englanders to send more troops to help um, get, get Burgoyne out of this territory. Uh, the death of Jane McRae. This could be a good story for someone to look into. Maybe write a screenplay about it and all. And poor Lieutenant Fraser with the scalp of Jane McRae um, and whatever happened to him. Uh, anyway, um, these 900 or so Germans are looking for horses now in Vermont. And New Hampshire has sent its militia force under John Stark. If you're from New Hampshire, you probably need, you, I, I'm not going to ask you to tell us about John Stark, who um, had resigned from the army because he saw other people getting promoted. He had fought at Bunker Hill. He got tired of being part of this where other people get promoted. So he had gone home. And now he is at home and he was reluctant to serve. But when New Hampshire asks, he does lead his men off to confront these German forces in the New Hampshire grants, which he does at Bennington, actually just outside, all over the border of, into New York, and defeats the 900 or so Germans at Bennington. This is a foraging party that Burgoyne had sent on his left flank as he's making its way down the river. And now you have Stark and the New Hampshire guys taking this force, which is more bad news for General Burgoyne. Um, he now knows Clinton's not coming, Howe's not coming, St. Laguerre is not coming, and now he's lost these 900 Germans who are supposed to be helping him out. By the way, the Germans are very good soldiers, and so this is a bad thing. And what happens then, I'll just get to the point of this. On the 17th of October, Burgoyne surrenders. Um, this is a major event. Remember, this is just a month and a half after Philadelphia had fallen. And Philadelphia, the British are still in the process of pacifying the area of Philadelphia. They're taking the forts along the Delaware River on the, the New Jersey side, the Pennsylvania side, and every, and every one of these forts. They're displacing the Americans who are holding them. But then one morning in late October, they hear all the cannon firing from these American forts that are being besieged by the British. And they don't know why that is until they get word that Burgoyne and his, his 7,000 man army have surrendered to the Americans. This is major news here. Um, the, you can see politically, this may have repercussions for Washington since Congress had been kicked out of, York, of uh, Philadelphia and are now in York, Pennsylvania because Washington couldn't protect them. But now you have a general who's able to capture a British army on the upper Hudson River. 
So the victory at Saratoga uh, by, well, Gates gets credit for it, even though he was reluctant to push his advantage. And at a critical moment, Benedict Arnold rallied the troops to force the surrender. I'm sorry, not giving you the blow by blow of the Battle of Saratoga. Actually, there are several battles of Saratoga in early October, culminating on the 17th of October with Gates's um, capture of Burgoyne's army. So a couple of things. One, what happens to Burgoyne's army once it is captured? You know, they're not going to, can't really send it back to Canada at this time of the year, and you wouldn't do that anyway. What they do, or what's done is they are marched to Massachusetts, actually to Boston. And the men are released on parole. They'll be sent back to England. Actually, a number of the Hessians remain in Massachusetts as prisoners of war. So the town of Rutland, for example, has a big German prisoner of war camp. And the Germans, it turns out, are very industrious, hardworking people who hate sitting around idly as prisoners of war. So they do a lot of work. And, and in fact, Rutland loans their Germans out to other towns who in fact request Rutland to send some Germans to um, do all kinds of salubrious things in these towns. And so the army, the convention army it is called because they sign a convention at Saratoga that they won't fight anymore in this particular war. And then the bigger news is this after Saratoga that the French government has been officially neutral, although the French king had secretly loaned a million leaves, the equivalent of about $200,000 to the Americans. And Auguste Beaumarchais had set up this dummy corporation that had shipped about 11,000 muskets, 1,000 barrels of gunpowder, other things to the Americans. But they weren't going to get involved in a war that the side they were backing couldn't win. The victory at Saratoga is evidence to the French court that the Americans actually can win the war. And on the 6th of February of 1778, the king uh, recognizes American independence. He receives Franklin at court and the king signs a treaty with the United States agreeing to fight the English until um, each side agrees to fight the English and not to make a peace separately. Now for getting the French on the side of the Americans was not an uncomplicated thing because of course um, you can see the French would wanna get into the war for the purpose of getting Canada back. But Franklin has to make that not a French war aim to get Canada. Instead the French have to fight until the British have recognized American independence. And this also is going to complicate the war for the English because now they have an enemy of 25 million people across the English Channel. And while the war was going on in North America, the British could you know, send troops from Britain to America. But now they have the threat of a French invasion of Britain. And if France brings her ally Spain into the war, Spain would be happy to go to war against England if it's gonna result in Gibraltar being brought back into the Spanish fold. And so the entry of France into the war really is terrifically bad news for the English. Lord Camden, who was an opposition leader in parliament, blasted Lord North and his government for starting a war on the belief that the Americans were cowards and the French were idiots. That inevitably the Americans and the French had both pro proving him wrong. And Lord North, the prime minister, recognized that he is really in a dilemma here. Because yes, you're gonna have a war with France, but also you're having this, they caused by this war in America. And he knows by this time, the Americans are not going to give up on independence at this point and the king is not going to grant independence. So North has to continue prosecuting the war and the war now is moving closer to home for the English. Are there any questions? I feel like I should pause and take a breath and let you, um, if anything has, by the way, usually if we were in class, I would be watching attentively to see if anyone is um, showing any signs of puzzlement or 
things they wanted to add. And I apologize for monopolizing the conversation. Lily, I have, have a, a question. Yes. Um, will you just repeat the last part about Americans not going to give up on the independence, but the like that okay. a little. So by this time, Lord North realizes, in fact, one thing that happens in the wake of this is Parliament rescinds the Declaratory Act that they had passed back in 1766, saying we can govern the colonies in all cases whatsoever. They rescind that. And they also send over commissioners to meet with the Americans to see how we can resolve this. But by this time, it's too late. Now, the Americans are not going to give up independence at this point and come back. You know, before 1775, that would have been a possibility. And it takes the British a long time to see this. So North realizes this. The Americans won't give up independence, but the king won't grant independence. So he, uh, and by the way, every year Lord North resigns as prime minister. The king every year refuses his resignation. And North realizes he can't really win this war. And now it's become much more difficult with the entrance of France into the war. Now, one thing makes it somewhat easier because British officers who had refused to serve in the American war now do serve in a war against the French. And the French are sending a fleet from Toulon to America. And the British are also sending a fleet to America. And these two fleets leave at about the same time. Had the British gotten their fleet ready sooner, it could have blocked the French from getting their fleet to North America. So it complicates the war by having the French enter it, but it makes it much more likely that the Americans will win. That makes sense. Good, other Thank questions you. or th other things? Um, yes, James. Quick thing, um, I'm kind of curious what, what was uh, in this for the French, um, because it, I, I mean, it doesn't seem like they made any attempt to retake Canada or anything, but um, were there any like colonies they were aiming to take in like the Caribbean? Yes, or... actually, yeah, that's a very good question because the French have holdings in the Caribbean and so do the British. And in fact, I will talk at great length later on about the naval battle at the Chesapeake in 1781 uh, in which the British lose and that prevents them from resupplying the, uh, their army at Yorktown. To the British, that is less important than the naval battle that happens the next year, the Battle of the Saints in the Caribbean, because the French and the English, they, remember, the Caribbean is really the focus for both of them. The sugar plantations of Martinique and uh, for the French, and Martinique, Guadalupe, and um, Saint-Domingue for the French, and for the English, uh, Montserrat and Barbados, and each one wants to take the others. And the Battle of the Saints prevents the French from taking any of these British holdings, and in fact weakens the French in the West Indies. So that is really very important to the French. Also, anything that can be done to weaken your, your principal adversary is a good thing. You know, so that's why the king had secretly been supplying the Americans, isn't going to do that publicly, because that will bring on a direct war. But now that your adversary has this enemy who's able to inflict damage, you can inflict more damage and who knows. This, it's gonna become more complicated as we'll see when negotiations begin over peace and where the border will be. And uh, Spain's entry into the war is also going, you know, Spain doesn't really enter the war for the purpose of securing American independence, but to get back Florida, which the uh, British held until 1783 and to protect Spain's other holdings in North America. And so, yeah, so they're not gonna get Canada back, but I don't think anyone in France really lamented the loss of Canada. They really would have lamented the loss of Saint-Domingue or Guadalupe or Martinique. Other, I'm, by the way, I'm happy to sit here for the rest of the night ask, answering, talking about the revolution because um, you're the only group that asks. So um, other questions, thoughts, if you need to go, you can. Um, and I won't be hurt if everyone shuts off, says, okay, thanks. Uh, we've had enough of this for one night, for one lifetime. Uh, and we'll, I'll see you then uh, next week, right? I lose track of the days. I'm here in my garret, so. When is the um, next project, the primary source, like the one you discussed? I'll have, to, I'll, have to I'll, I'll have to check the syllabus and get back to you on that. Thank you for asking, okay. Lila. Thank you. Good to see you.
I think the syllabus said October 30th. October 30th. Yeah. I so it'll so. be around then. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, okay. Lane. Now, Lane. Uh, yes, Professor. Um, did you send in a paper? I don't remember. Uh, no, I was going to email you about okay. that. Okay. Didn't mean to ask you in front of others, but yeah. Okay. No, no worries. Okay. Yeah. Professor Allison, yes. since you were talking about um, papers at the end of the, I, I, didn't, I haven't gotten my grade yet for the paper. I just wanted to make sure that you got my email. Did bit. I send you comments on it? No. Okay. Well, I'll check again. I may not, not gotten to it. I'll let you know when I have some. Okay. Thanks I just for letting me know. Sure Thanks for letting me know. Okay. Actually, yeah. Uh, can I chime in with another question here? Sure, uh, sure. So, I'm I'm kind of curious now um, because I, I understand that the Caribbean was um, incredibly important just for the sugar plantations and everything, and um, I'm kind of wondering with the American colonies, um, were they? Was this is sort of a broad question too? Is 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 was the war in America to some extent? you know, about British pride so much as, as an economic interest? Or I'm kind of curious about how important uh, North America was to Britain economically. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And North America was important because of its connection with the West Indies, um, producing ships and barrels in New England, as well as codfish, to feed the labor force there. Wheat in New York and Pennsylvania, again, to feed the labor force, and in Pennsylvania and New York. And then, you know, tobacco and rice, the commodities produced in the Chesapeake but, and in the Carolinas, but also the trade with the Indians in all of these places. So it really is a trade system that has worked out here and the West Indies being the thing that produces sugar, which is the great commodity, but then you have all of these other pieces to it, which are also essential. So it's a, it's a very good question. So economically, is it going to, uh, are they, they important in and of themselves? Well, no, um, the, the, some of the commodities they produce are, and it's actually trying to get some of the gain of this. It's this trade that's going on, I think, that's important, as well as the potential of the future. They're looking at the interior of North America and all of the land there. And this has been the big question, what happens with the land? Is it going to be uh, held by the Indians? Is it going to be occupied by people like the Virginians or the Pennsylvanians or the Canadians? I mean, these are all really very serious questions. Um, and it's really, as I'm seeing it, it's after the 1750s, 1760s, British policymakers are beginning to see the importance of this empire. And previously, the thinking had been that colonies are a drain on the mother country, which is why the Spain, Spanish and the French really restricted who could go to their colonies. The British colonies are really prove that to be wrong. This is something Adam Smith writes about in The Wealth of Nations, which comes out in 1776. And also something Franklin had written about, that the growth of population in North America and at the same time, the population in England is growing. The thinking was, the more people who go to the colonies, that means there are fewer people in the mother country, but actually America proves that wrong. So just you know, to make it concise, economically, are they important to England in and of themselves? No, but it's because of their overall relationship. And you know, by this time, of course, um, you know, Britain does pretty well after losing the North American colonies, and partly because after there are a few blips, but after 1815, the American colony, the, Ameri the United States and England develop a close trading relationship. They remain close traders. Uh, there, there's an anecdote at the end of the negotiations in Paris by which England loses the American colonies. And one of the French negotiators is saying to one of the British negotiators, kind of teasing him saying, three million Americans were British subjects and now they're all independent. And the English negotiator says, yes, and they all speak English. 
you know, so France an invasion, possibly getting these allies, but uh, it's, you know, it's a very good question. It's actually one of the good fundamental questions here that I've been puzzling over. Sean, your light lit up. I didn't know if you had a question or if you're just... Oh, no, I was just listening along. Okay. And um, I, I um, also, uh, I guess it is a little bit of a question, but it's more so a uh, just following up with you about uh, my paper. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am going to continue writing on some stuff. About good. London. But um, so what exactly would you like to see? Because I, I got in contact with the town clerk and the person who... Uh, one of the people who works at the Malden Public Library, mm -hmm. and uh, I already have like a lot of stuff to look Good. through, basically. Good. But um, just anything in particular, because I no. have just literally anything. <laughs> yeah, and it would be good if you um, if they've done a list of what they have. If you could show us that, what I think would might be helpful, since you are I think further along with this than others, if you could talk about this on Monday. Uh, it doesn't need to be a formal presentation, but this is what I found, and this is how I found it, because I right, think yeah, it would help sure. other people get the idea of how they could go about doing this. All right, yeah, sweet. Um, yeah, because I have, I have like seven or eight pages of like pretty in-depth, wow. like witty, like itty-gritty, like, great. and all written, like, in like the actual books. Oh, I wow. couldn't like take the pictures myself because of COVID, but yeah, uh, wow. yeah, it's, I'm actually very excited about That's this. great. That is great. That's exactly what I was hoping people would do. And I don't know what you're going to find. So I really can't tell you what it is I want you to find or what it is I want you to do. So it's for me great. to discover. That's, that's it's right. the history yeah. process in action. That, that, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I have one more quick question for you. Yes. I heard from a classmate that you are not a big fan of Woodrow Wilson. No, I please fan. get like a little bit of the story. I need to hear this. Well, you know, it, it depends on what day of the week it is. But no, uh, Wilson is usually my first example of why you should never vote for a college professor. Because <laughs> college professors, we're very good at talking, but we're really not very good at doing what politicians need to do, which is to engage with other politicians. And, you know, college professors like to lecture, as you can probably tell. And we know you're really smart if um, at the end of the semester, everything you say agrees with what we say. And if for some reason you disagree, what we do is we simply repeat what we've just said using smaller words and speaking more slowly. You know, but Wilson had that kind of college professor idea of being always right and being able to lecture things. Uh, and then other things, you know, he had this vision of the world conforming to Wilson's idea of how the world should operate. And so the 14 points where he's going to remake the world. I mean, he, he's supposed to be an historian. And uh, so a historian should know that the world is a complicated place and is impervious to the designs of uh, someone like Professor Wilson. Um, Georges Clemenceau, the president of France, when Wilson kept talking about the 14 points, Clemenceau said, God only had 10 points. And it's that that, and Wilson, you know, does other things that, you know, uh, he becomes a real hero. Well, he expands the scope of the federal government well beyond what needed to be done to fight the war. And that is something that the consequences we still live with, the basically taking over of the railroads, the entire economy and so on. Um, that's a political disagreement, I suppose I have, as well as, you know, segregating the um, federal bureaucracy. Uh, blacks no longer could serve in the federal bureaucracy. You know, it's Wilson, you know, he's not unique in being an inveterate racist, but you no, know, he is, and he's more blatant than others. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so that's, um, that's it in a nutshell. I think it is the sanctimoniousness of Wilson, the self-righteousness that gets me more than anything else. So, um, yeah, uh, and, and think about this, you know, here is, his, you know what his first name really was? What? Thomas. Okay, so someone's first name is Thomas, but he wants to be called Woodrow. And as a boy, he had over his picture, uh, over his bed, a picture of Gladstone, the British Prime Minister. He really saw the president as like the Prime Minister. He really liked the British system. And so, you know, he has the William Gladstone over his bed. And when someone asked young Woodrow, no one ever called him Woody, 
what he wanted to do when he grew up, what he wanted to be. He said a statesman, which is definitely what he was. But um, and I have no knock against that. If you know you or James or Dylan want to be a statesman, that's great. But um, it's the reshaping the world to fit the way you think the world should operate that I think is, um, yeah, something that I find um, less appealing about Wilson. Uh, and, and I'm sure now that you've raised the question, I'll spend the rest of the night thinking about other things I don't like about Woodrow Wilson. And, um, yeah. Do you have strong feelings about Wilson or any feelings? Well, the thing is, is like, um, he's obviously a very contentious character. Yeah. Like, didn't oh, he yeah. have the, uh, he had like the, what was that movie? Like the Song of the South or something? Like oh, no, that, the uh, uh, Birth of a Nation. Oh, yeah, yeah. that one. And he yeah. had that, like, played on the White House, right? Yeah, he did. And, you know, uh, William Monroe Trotter was an African-American journalist in Boston. And he was also a cantankerous guy, by the way. And But Trotter, unlike most other African-Americans, had supported Wilson in 1912. Most African-Americans were Republicans. And Trotter said, we don't do ourselves any favor by always supporting the same group. And here, you know, Wilson may be appealing. And then uh, Wilson does things like, you know, segregates the bureaucracy and Trotter is leading the campaign to have birth of a nation banned in Boston. And um, Trotter in a group, a delegation goes to call on Wilson at the White House. And Trotter, as was his want, starts asking questions. And Wilson says, I really don't like your tone. It was, it was really effrontery that this black guy is, you know, talking to him this way. And uh, as Trotter kicked out of the White House. You know, Trotter had been arrested 10 years, a dozen years earlier for um, asking pointed questions at a Booker T. Washington meeting in Boston. He'd actually gone to jail for that one. Um, but yeah, so, um, you know, Wilson does, you know, Birth of a Nation, he says it was like history written with lightning. And it's really the nation that's being born is the Ku Klux Klan. And this is, it's a controversial film for a number of reasons. One, because D.W. Griffiths, the director, was technologically probably the best director of the era. And so technically, this is one of the first really proficient films. But then the whole theme is how terrible it is that black people are getting voting rights in these southern states. And uh, this is why the nation of the Ku Klux Klan is being born. Um, yeah, so it's not the only film that is technologically brilliant, but morally flawed. It's, uh, I think, part of the thing about the meeting. But yeah, Wilson shows it at the White House. And again, he's, an, he's not just the president. He's the guy, he, he'd been, he's president of the American Historical Association. So this is giving it the imprimatur of the historical profession. There's also another story. Um, in, it was while Wilson was president that the American Historical Association had its annual meeting in Boston, and there was a reception at the Massachusetts Historical Society, and Wilson, he might have been currently the president of the AHA, he also was currently president of the United States, was there, as was a former president of the AHA, who was also a former president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. And there was someone who, at the Historical Society whose job was to make sure Roosevelt and Wilson never actually have to talk to each other. That these two guys have to be kept apart because they really did hate each other. And it would have been quite a oh. dramatic scene. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, so you know, it's interesting. Just here you have these two guys who are presidents of the AHA. Also, Henry Cabot Lodge was an historian and Lodge senator from Massachusetts is really responsible for scuttling. Well, he would say it was Wilson who scuttled the Versailles Treaty because uh, Lodge was prepared to go along with a League of Nations, but didn't want Article 10 of the treaty would surrender American sovereignty. And there were some isolationists in the Senate or among the Republicans who didn't want the treaty at all, but Lodge probably could have gotten the treaty through, but Wilson wouldn't budge. Wilson was sure it was my whole treaty or nothing, and he gets nothing. Um, actually, it must be sunset. I just heard the cannon from the Constitution firing. So, um, so um, anyway, yeah, so that's part of my, uh, you know, Wilson. Yeah, we all need to have someone that we don't really like that much. You know, H.L. Mencken has a great little essay called, about the Archangel Woodrow. And Mencken is one of my favorite 
journalists and he um, really just didn't like Wilson because Will, the archangel, you know, he is you know, the bringing this good news. And uh, um, anyway, are you glad you asked her? Boy, I wish it didn't I am. Her. I will yeah. say, I will say out of all the history professors I've had here, you tell probably the most in-depth and entertaining stories. I think it's just the way you kind of tell them. Oh, thanks. That's what I try to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's a lot of like these stories we've told in this class, actually, have been, uh, excuse my language, it's been pretty like hysterical. I was going to swear there, but I, was, I covered it up. Okay, well, that's, you know, they, they're fascinating stories. They're, they're interesting people. Mm -hmm. And I think you can lose that really easily. And it's something I've learned over the years of teaching is that people do respond to interesting stories about people mm -hmm. and you can then deduce from that all kinds of things yeah. but um the theory is less important uh, you know it, it's something you know really smart per if i were smarter maybe i would be better at theory and thing underlying causes you can kind of get i kind of infer them from the way the characters act mm -hmm. and how they act and how they react. Because we have to remember that they're facing situations just as we're facing situations. Never really sure how best to respond or what all of the possible outcomes will be. Mm -hmm. You know, we um, act a very kind of uh, uncertain, you know, we, we don't know all the consequences. As Charles Beard, another historian said, we hold a damn dim candle over a damned dark abyss. And it's all we're trying to do and just trying to discern motives and things. And um, it's one of the things that makes it interesting. Um, so. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening to me uh, talk well, for a little bit. Well, thank you for listening to me talk for a more than a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, if you, if you do want me to do uh, or just talk to the class a little bit on Monday, uh, yeah. just let me know. I will. And I think what I'll do, Sean, is have you uh, share your screen if you have anything written that you can show them, because that I think would be really helpful. Uh, I have it all in a Dropbox folder, but I can I can probably get some stuff written. This I, bet, I bet if it's a Dropbox folder, I don't know, maybe you could open it up. Uh, you know, we could try, try it out beforehand if that would help and see if you share it, if you can open a Dropbox folder on the Zoom. Okay. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll look into that. Okay. Very good. Have a good weekend. You too, Professor. Take care. Bye, James. <laughs>